Lisa Barr, and I'm a Senior Development Officer at Silicon Valley Community Foundation and one of the co-leads of SV Gives. We have a team of about 12 people from all across our organization working on this initiative. Um, and so we're really excited to welcome from Benton Communications, Mercy and Alyssa for today. They'll be speaking with you about uh, how you can help promote your nonprofit in the traditional media. Um, so we'll have some more folks coming in this morning and there's some coffee and pastries in the back if you'll help yourselves. Um, we also have passed out to you on your way in a feedback form. So we would really love to have your responses to that form um, after today's session if you want to drop it with us at the desk on your way out. So thanks for being, oh actually I should ask, who here is uh, new to SV Gives for this year? Ooh, that's good. And people who did SV Gives in the past? Awesome. Great, great. Well, um, I'll let these guys take it away. And if there are other specific SV Gives questions that you have, my colleague Erica and I are here and we'd be happy to chat with you after today's session. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Thanks so much for the warm welcome. Um, so a little bit more about us and about Fenton. Uh, Fenton is a social change communications firm. We work with a lot of nonprofits, foundations, companies in the sphere of trying to make the world a better place. Um, <clears throat> we are a full service communications firm across media, digital, social media. Uh, we do graphic design, websites, um, you name it. Uh, some of the clients that we have in the Bay Area, uh, we work with some Bay Area based organizations. One of them is uh, First Place for Youth. Another, Alive and Free, uh, we worked with Center for Youth Wellness, Playworks, some of the, some of the players around here, um, Renewable Funding, um, and some big uh, foundations that are national, like Annie E. Casey and uh, the William K. Kellogg Foundation. Just to give you a little bit about Fenton and a flavor of what we do. Um, I'm Alyssa Singer. I am uh, in my fourth year at Fenton Communications, and I'm uh, primarily focused on our health and social justice practices at Fenton, um, specializing in media, project management, and social, social and digital. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mercy Alvaran. Uh, I'm also a senior account executive at Fenton, uh, just starting my third year, actually. And um, I also work in mostly our social justice human rights space. Um, I actually come from um, working in-house nonprofit communications. So I have been in those shoes. <laughs> and um, I also specialize in media relations and a lot of training and capacity building for our clients. So, yeah. Good to meet you all. A little bit about what we're going to cover today. So uh, instead of diving right into how to pitch a journalist, we're going to start with when is media actually the right strategy for you? Um, it's not always the thing that's going to help you accomplish your goals. So we want to first talk about how to tell whether it's the right strategy. Then we'll get into how to prepare for that pitch, how to make the pitch, and then how to keep that beautiful relationship going with those reporters. Um, and then finally, we'll talk about a couple of options for when media might not be the right strategy for you. What are some other uh, strategies out there that you could? So I myself, coming from a nonprofit background, I think we can all um, agree that uh, you know we don't have a lot of time, we don't have a lot of resources. We have to be scrappy and creative, which is why I think you know we need to think about you know just like what Alyssa said, really is this the right strategy? And some of the things that you have to come up with and think about when you're thinking about that are number one, what are your actual goals? Um, so think about you know is it a campaign? Are you trying to get more funding? Are you trying to pass a bill? Um, when you start thinking about your goals, try to make them as uh, tangible and as specific as possible. So some things that we've heard, like, well, our goal is to get more media and to raise our awareness. Um, probably don't start with those, uh, but start to whittle down. If you're like, well, we really do want to get awareness for our organization, ask yourself why. You know, are we trying to in increase funding? Are we trying to change public opinion about this issue that we work on? Uh, those kinds of goals. Try to narrow it as much as you can. Um, and, you know, while thinking of your goals, you also want to think of, well, who is our audience? Who are we trying to reach? Um, and I think the question that, you know, we always tell people to ask themselves is, who are the people that we need to reach our goal? If we don't have those people, we won't reach them. So again, like, the more vague you are, not as helpful. So things like voters, 
well, we want to get women on board, or you know, we want the general public. You know, not as helpful. Uh, try to narrow down a little bit, um, and you know, we'll give you some examples, so that's a little bit helpful. Um, yeah, again, just try to be as specific as possible. So, for example, uh, last year we were working with an organization called Californians for Safety and Justice. I don't know if you've heard of them, but um, they were one of the major groups that got Prop 47 passed, uh, which basically reduced a lot of um, nonviolent convictions from felonies to misdemeanors. So for folks that were coming out of the system who have served their time, you know, um, moving a felony to a misdemeanor made it easier for them to get a job, get housing, and just get their life back on track. Um, but even though uh, this had passed, they were getting a lot of uh, pushback uh, from folks, especially uh, more conservative legislators, mostly folks in like the Central Valley. Um, so actually when we were thinking about that, we're like, well, we wanna change public opinion. You know, we wanna make sure that um, you know, people understand like where we're coming from. And we decided that the actual target is gonna be those conservative legislators in the Central Valley. So you see, we've already sort of narrowed down from legislators, from voters, from people to the specific audience. So think about it that way. So is media the right strategy? Uh, to be in the news, you need news. Um, and it may sound funny, but it's actually a pretty big question. Um, <clears throat> you can think of reporters as people who report to editors, um, and in order for them to be able to bring something to their edi editor, it has to be timely and it has to be important. Um, so why now and why should they care? Um, what do you have to share that's newsworthy? I mean, most of us who work at nonprofits, we don't have the news cachet of Obama announcing a new Supreme Court justice. Um, <laughs> reporters are probably not already knocking down your door. But even though we might not have something that reaches the level of news value that might be splashy front page news, there are a couple of creative ways to create a news hook where there might not already be an obvious one. And so we're going to go through a few of those ways now. Um, the first one uh, is really wonderful is to release data. Uh, study your program. Study the people that you work with. Take a survey. Come up with a percentage or a number that you can position as news. Um, this is an example of a report release. Um, the uh, Ella Baker Center for Human Rights and Forward Together did a, an extensive report that studied the impact of incarceration on families of incarcerated people. Um, and they came up with some really uh, striking findings and, and because of that we're able to land this beautiful piece in the New York Times. But we know not everybody has the resources and the time to commit to crafting your own data. But a lot of times, you don't actually need to be the organization that released the data in order to use it as a news hook. Um, this is a great case to be made for always um, reading the news and watching the news and making sure you're, you're monitoring topics that you care about that are related to your programs. Set up a news alert so that when US Census data comes out or when Pew releases something new that's related to what you do, you can use that as a news hook. This is a, a story that came out about how um, in the US Census, people think that automation is taking away their jobs, but not, not their jobs, other people's jobs. So if, you do, uh, if your organization did something about the future of work, for example, this could be a way for you to pitch the media for your organization. Um, you can leverage that, that new release in order to make your uh, organization answer the question of why now? Why should the reporter write about you now? These next three are all related to trends. So this is another way to answer the question of why now. They say you only actually need three other, three total events to happen that are related to each other to establish a trend. So another strong case for monitoring the news, setting up an alert so you receive an email anytime something happens that's related to your program. That's how you establish a trend. You say, hey reporter, this is happening in this and this other place. You can localize a national story. Something big is happening in the nation's capital, across the world. You can say, here's an example of it happening here in our neighborhood and pitch your local media. Same thing works in reverse. Nationalize a local story. You can say, here's something that's happening here that has been happening here for a very long time. And hey, look, the New York Times just wrote about it. It's not about us, but here, local paper, this is why you should write about us now. 
And this is an example. Um, this is from the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Uh, the uh, Association of American Pediatrics released a recommendation that pedi pediatricians nationally should be screening families for poverty. And so this was an opportunity for local uh, organizations who were doing poverty alleviation work in Cleveland to get a spotlight on their programs. Um. Um, so a couple more um, things to think about. Um, you know, be creative. Find a new spin on a holiday or a, a, you know an event on the calendar. Um, you know, for example, um, you know one of the organizations that we're connected to um, last week was International Women's Day, uh, and uh, the National Domestic Workers Association used this as an opportunity to highlight you know the plight of domestic workers. Uh, mostly, these are women. And um, there is currently a campaign in California to make sure that uh, an overtime law stays that way. Um, and there's other things you can think about, you know, Mother's Day, even stuff like the Super Bowl, back to school. What are sort of times on the calendar that could connect your work to anything that's sort of timely? Because remember, reporters want things that are timely. Why should you be writing about me now? Well, it's Mother's Day, and we work with mothers of incarcerated folks and we think this would be a great story. One caveat to that, mm -hmm. um, we find a lot of nonprofits wanting to make a week, like a teen domestic violence cessation week. Um, it's difficult to make holiday or calendar stories happen mm -hmm. if those events uh, aren't already a well-known calendar event or holiday. It's very difficult for a nonprofit to start an appreciation day for their thing and to get momentum behind it. Um, it's wonderful to use things that already have news value, like back to school calendar events that everyone already knows about as a news hook. But trying to make your own thing may be an uphill battle. <laughs> yeah, we were just joking yesterday. We were like, don't make a thing a thing if it's not a thing. <laughs> That's easy to remember, right? <laughs> Uh, so a couple more ideas for news hooks. Um, human interest. Um, so really some things that are really powerful in the news is just hearing people's personal stories. Um, you know, homelessness is an issue that is huge in the Bay Area and is talked about all the time. Um, but one thing that was really interesting was this reporter um, actually took a mother and son and had them tell their own story. So even if, you know, the topic that you're working on, um, you know, poverty alleviation or you're working on, you know, um, education, health access, people are talking about this all the time, but if you have people that you work with that have really powerful personal stories, and you know they're from the local area, um, this would be a great opportunity to pitch that to a reporter as well. Uh, because really, you know, what draws uh, readers in a lot of times is not just the facts and all those things, but people's personal powerful stories. Uh, and then the last one is kind of like a no-brainer. If you've got a celebrity or uh, someone prominent in the local area, um, like a big politician involved, uh, definitely use them as a hook for your media. <laughs> uh, so for example, here we worked with uh, Yes We Code um, last year, who's was working to diversify um, the tech sector by um, teaching over 100,000 kids of color to code. Um, and so they had partnered with Prince for a big announcement, and so we're like, yeah, you definitely want to, you know, talk about prints in your pitches, so. Key takeaway, get prints on board. <laughs> activity, activity time. <laughs> Good morning, We're gonna, We're gonna do a partner activity. We'd ask you to pair up with someone that you did not arrive here with, someone that doesn't work at your organization, and we're gonna do some practice of finding the news hook. So, we've got some scenarios. Uh, you'll choose your scenario based on your birthday month, and uh, you'll choose, you've got a scenario here based on your birthday month, and then we want you to choose one type of these news hooks, the eight that we just went over, to say what your news hook is going to be for this scenario. Um, you can make up things about the conditions of the world in which your news story is. You can make up trends. Uh, you can invent humans that are part of your human interest story. We just want to get your wheels turning, your creative juices flowing about how to find a news hook when it's not already obvious. Um, so we'll have about five 
to 10 minutes for this uh, activity, and then we'll ask a couple of groups to share uh, what they came up with. So please find a partner. Uh, we'd love it if it's someone that is new to you, that you didn't come here with, and, and we'll get started. What did you all think? Does anyone have their news hook that they'd like to share? Okay. Please. This is my colleague Donna. We work for an organization that um, is called the October December organization. <laughs> we focus on STEM learning. And um, because this is a, a, a national movement, uh, getting children uh, involved in STEM to help them prepare for the future, we, we, we find that, or we feel that we connect in a big way to what's going on across the country and, and nationally, but what's special about what we do in, in the Bay Area, in our special organization? We feel that since we live in this unique area where we have access to all these um, up and coming dot coms and, and the big tech companies, but we also have this unique ecosystem in, in this area. So what the October December uh, organization uh, does, nonprofit does, is that we are trying to get children interested in STEM from different areas. And so we've got these wonderful activities um, with the Exploratorium and yeah, and, I'm not from there. <laughs> and um, uh, all the wonderful um, eco programs in the Bay Area. Then we have these young dot com kids that are a different kind of engineer. And so we are using these local resources to get kids and get engaged in STEM. And one of the things that we found, just in, in wrapping up here, is that um, we wanted to have the teachers and the parents involved, of course. And so what we did was we engaged with the school systems and using their existing testing that they do in the spring or before summer vacation and when they come back in the fall, we measured, uh, we, we did a study, an analysis, I'm sorry, of the, uh, uh, the test scores and we found that these kids being involved in summer uh, programs like this actually improved their scores when they came back as opposed to uh, summer learning loss, which is becoming a term everywhere. And so give money now and lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> so you actually released your own data. You, yeah. you did News Hub yeah. number one, you released data. And we connected to a national movement. Great, great. And maybe, maybe once your data comes out, you can actually find other data that's out there too. You could both release your own data and link into sort of localizing a national story, which is then uh, number four. So you did two of them, that's great. Um, anyone else want to share their news hub? Why now? Why is this timely? Why should we write about the STEM or the seahorses? or the environmental and pollution regulations. Why now and why is it important? Why is Prince involved? <laughs> <laughs> Any other groups want to share? Or if you found this activity difficult for any particular reason, if you want to share some of the thought processes you went through and questions, uh, questions you might have. Well, we're working on sea courses and we sort of struggled with the um, with the question of why, why sea horses, um, in terms of like how to, how to make it relatable and how to make it meaningful, and we only heard we certainly talked about the, the holiday and the food the around birthday, but I feel like that is also pretty, there's a lot of competition for the question of the holiday as well. So then we also talked about like local museums and like so the Cal Academy of Sciences could be like a partner and like getting one over with their night like events or something like that. Um, but other people have, and maybe you guys have this, but this idea of like targeting donors for some reason becomes a more, for me at least, it's becoming like a more tricky thing than just targeting, you know, potential people back that be interested in some more information in other ways or like be made aware. Did you have a comment regarding what she was mentioning as well? We did. We did. 
too. Uh huh. And we came up with using a celebrity. We talked about Michael Phelps, and because of the Olympics coming up, and the fact that he has swam all these interesting places and his habitat, and then tying it into like a seahorse, and it's really getting people interested. I mean, donors give what they're passionate about. And so if you can bring that awareness of seahorses with someone who's already, people are fascinated by, that's, that's what we came up with. Great, great. And I thought I would just, I mean, you're right uh, about donors being a tricky audience for media. Um, and the way that you can think about it is that media is just one of a number of touch points that a donor needs. Um, a donor is not likely to give just from seeing a media story, but maybe from seeing the media story, they sign up for your email list. Or maybe for, from seeing the media story, they will like you on Facebook. Um, and th that's a way to build these touch points, because the first way to get more donors is to grow your audience of people who just sort of know about the organization. So it's more of a long range donor outreach plan for media. If, if your goal is to get donors today for your you know, event, Media, maybe not. Um, uh, if, if you're trying to get short-term donations, maybe you're you're more likely to look at a different strategy, like a, um, a giving campaign for email or social media. Anyone else? Did anyone have the um, environmental regulations scenario? Yeah, we did. We didn't kind of come up with a full pitch, but we looked. Yeah, so we had the environmental and pollution regulations, and so we just kind of talked it talk it through about what news hook we would use and how we would kind of address this because our audience was state policymakers. Um, so we talked about, I think, at least like my first or my obvious go-to is leveraging data. Um, so, but, so coming out, let's say, advocating for some kind of tougher environmental and pollution regulations, backing it up with some new report. Um, about the dangers of the Midwestern states, the dangers of fracking, and you know, kind of what's coming out right now. So probably there's a lot of fracking, or a lot of oil um, kind of happening. But um, a lot of times, I think with policymakers, you're not as effective if you just do, if you just kind of do the data. So you have to have kind of a human interest piece. So I would say like reporting on maybe some big report that came out showing the detrimental environmental effects of fracking that's happening near, you know, near their communities or their constituents, um, but then tying in a human interest piece or maybe interviewing or bringing or having to speak somebody, you know, like a mother and children or children who are being affected by, you know, the chemicals that are being released by the fracking that's going on near the community. Um, and so having, you know, going in there maybe with, you know, you're advocating for a specific tough regulation, having the data and then tying in a human interest piece Great. Does anyone else have a, a, a thought or a question or a scenario to share? How do you determine if you've got a whole bunch of things that you think are newsworthy around a particular project or whatever? How do you how do you prioritize that? How do you decide what's the right one? That's a great question. Um, I think well we're going to get into a little bit more um, in the next sec section about targeting an outlet and targeting a specific reporter. So those questions will, will definitely be among, like if you have multiple news hooks um, and you have a reporter who's already your friend, maybe use the one that they write about. Um, if you have multiple news hooks and one of them would appeal more to a newspaper that your target audience is going to be more likely to read, maybe go with that one. It really depends on what your goals are. Um, but that's a great question, and I think we'll we'll try to refer to that as we move into the next sections. Well, I just have a question about the human interest, about you know how we make the topic actually interesting in general. I don't I, maybe I'll lay I didn't hear about the human interest part. So I think that's the part I'm not really sure how to come up with that. Yeah, I think um, the main thing that we talked about with human interest stories are just that um, you know. You know, for a lot of reporters, like having that personal, like moving story from someone can really like put a face to an issue. Um, so, like the example was homelessness in the Bay Area, um, and you know it's a topic that's talked about all the time. Um, but a reporter, you know, brought a mother and a son who were homeless and had them talk about their own story. Um, so instead of just talking about you know this is the issue, this is the law we want to get passed, 
um, actually bringing in you know people who are directly affected mm -hmm. um, and you know having them tell their own story, having them be the face can really drive the point home you know much more effectively than just a bunch of data or yeah, instead of talking about your organization, mm -hmm. um, you're instead talking about a person, um, which it just makes for a better story. It's similar to number six, which is this idea of having a fresh spin on a holiday. Um, a human interest story is a way to put a fresh spin on something that's already been reported on. You wouldn't be advertising to the reporter that they'll be the first reporter to cover homelessness in the Bay Area, but it'll be the first time that uh, there can be this opportunity to speak to a mother and son together in the conversation between them about being homeless. So that there's something unique about the story based on the person whose story you're going to tell or who's going to tell their own story. It's a fresh spin on an issue that's already part of a trend or already sort of top of mind for the reporter that you're working with. Uh, we use this, uh, this fresh spin um, for the Super Bowl this year. Uh, when the Super Bowl came to the Bay Area, we saw a lot of Super Bowl stories that weren't actually very about sports at all, um, which I thought was a really excellent example of how journalism can take um, a holiday or an event and turn it into substantive journalism. Um, there was some stories in the Chronicle about how the Super Bowl coming to town was an opportunity to spotlight human trafficking problems in the Bay Area, how um, the fact that homeless people were being moved uh, was a new and fresh reason to you know, really address the homeless problem in uh, San Francisco, not just cover it up. That, uh, and there was some really great reporting that went, went down around that time. Um, so that's just an example um, of sort of human interest and, and being a fresh spin. Does anyone else have any other thoughts before we move on from this? I think we tried to stem to kind of get uh, caught up on which, which number to use and go after. Um, we thought about doing a special, a special event, spin on a special calendar event that was already going on. Um, you know, then we were trying to come up with the summer leverage of, you know, a little out of school time, you know, so we didn't tap into that education like they were talking about here. The loss of you know going to school in summer, yeah, yeah the loss, especially with math and science, has been continuous thinking. So um, that's what we got caught up on. Well, I mean, sort of summer loss is a is a calendar event, especially in education circles. Um, you see, I mean, just as much as education outlets are writing back to school pieces. They write back, they write spring break pieces, they write they write pieces about summer programs too. Um, I think sort of every news cycle, every year, there it seems like there's a story about how uh, summer creates a setback, you know. It seems every day that you, you see a piece like, so-and-so is thinking about taking away recess or taking away summer break, or it's, it's these sort of tropes in no matter what the beat issue area is, um, and how can you be a fresh look at that? Thing that you know they're probably going to write about anyway. So how do you get your organization in that story and help them make it more interesting too? That's great. Yeah, that's a good one. Cool. All right. Great job, you guys. Um, just a couple other things to think about before we move on to the next section. Um, again, you know, time, manpower is a huge issue for nonprofits. Um, so just things, questions to really ask yourself. Um, before you decide to pursue a media strategy, especially because, you know, it changes people all the time. You know, do you actually have the person power to do it? Um, just really thinking about that. Um, because, you know, we'll, we'll go into some things in the next section that'll show, like, it can take some time and a lot of research to do this kind of stuff. So it's important to think about that before you dive in. Um, and then similarly, also think about, do you have spokespeople that are ready, you know, for a reporter to talk to? Your DD, would it be you know folks that you work with, members, anyone like that? So um, just last things to think about before you decide to do this media strategy. Cool. All right. So you've decided. Yes, I have news. I have goals. I have an audience. I want to do a media strategy. So what's next? Um, it's time to talk about. Well, how do I reach out to these reporters now? Um, you know, think about, based on your audience, your goals, 
in your news hook, what would be the best type of media outlet to actually pitch a story to? Because there's so many different kinds, right? Um, you know, for example, say um, you're having a rally at the Capitol. There's going to be a lot of folks there. You're having some legislators there support you. That type of story, probably good for TV, actually. Very visual. You know, you're going to have prominent spokespeople, a critical mass of folks that, you know, a cameraman can like, get a good shot of. That kind of stuff, probably for TV. Um, a human interest story. Um, maybe you have someone who has a really powerful story and they can tell it really well. Um, what about radio? That could be a good opportunity to have someone come in and actually share, um, you know, how STEM education has affected them as a young person. Some other places you could pitch. Um, you know, definitely local and regional newspapers are huge for us. You know, say you're an organization in the South Bay, um, San Jose, you know, working on education, um, you're definitely going to want to think about the San Jose market. You know, folks like that. Or if you're up here in the Bay, uh, up here in um, you know San Francisco, the Chronicle. You know, so really just keep in mind local newspapers. You know, are you know really where it's at. Um, and then I'd say you know there's also like trade and special interest. Um, you know, blogs and um, outlets. So say you're working with an organization, you're an organization that works on a lot of racial justice issues. Um, you would definitely want to pitch color lines. You know, that's like what they write about all the time. Um, yeah. Um, and more and more business journals, local business journals, are covering nonprofit organizations and foundations. So um, even though you're out of business, you might still get picked up by a local business journal. Um, and especially these niche publications, health, trades, business trades, um, don't forget about them. Uh, There's sort of also sometimes sort of lower hanging fruit, easier to get. Um, than uh, big locals and nationals. Yeah. Everyone wants to be in the New York Times, but <laughs> it also might not be the best outlet to even target. Yeah. If, if you're looking to target teachers, you want to be an edgy. Yeah. So, you know, there might be some pressure from your executive director for board members to get the biggest paper, but maybe that's not actually in the, the best direct service of your organization's goals. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we know that when media is on the table, uh, you're getting pressure from a lot of different angles, but be ready to talk about your goals and to question um, things that are asked of you as part of a media strategy um, to really make sure that those goals are driving the strategy itself. Do you have a way that you uh, can pitch to a celebrity to get involved? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this, it, all, it has to be something the celebrity is already interested in. Um, one example, uh, again, with the Super Bowl was first place for youth was able to get um, NFL players and a few actors on board uh, because some of them had actually been in foster care. And first place for youth is a foster care advocacy organization. Or um, they had otherwise demonstrated a commitment to the issue. I think that sort of cold pitching celebrities who isn't necessarily the best route. Um, same thing with cold pitching journalists. Um, you're much more likely to have some luck if they're already interested in the story. Um, and ask your board members who they know. Sometimes it might surprise you. Um, a personal in is always going to be easier with a celebrity. Um, ask your board members if they know anybody's agent or anybody's mom. You know, <laughs> it, it, with, with celebrities, it's a lot about personal angles. So ask around. You might be surprised what who people have connections to. We just found out that our coworker's mom is best friends with Will Ferrell's mom. <laughs> <laughs> she waited a year and a half to tell us that. <laughs> you never know. Um, but yeah, so you've got your outlet. You know, now you want to actually target the reporter. Um, so I think you know one idea that we really want you to come away from is just like um, really think of yourself. Put yourself in a reporter's shoes. You know, um, the changing landscape of journalism has really affected how accessible reporters are. Um, you know, there's less funding, less reporters at an outlet. They're getting hundreds of pitches a day. So honestly, the more helpful and targeted and um, customized you can be, the more helpful you can be. Um, so, you know, you know, you're working on an issue. You know, you can do things like review reporters' past coverage. You know, you don't need fancy tools to do it either. 
Um, you can simply like go on the San Francisco Chronicle's news website and say, you know, who's writing about education? You know, look up this person, check out what are their past articles if they'd be interested in something that your organization is working on. Um, and also, reporters, like a majority of them, a striking majority of them, are on Twitter. Um, a huge, great free resource to really just do some creeping. <laughs> uh, you know, Google them, find their Twitter handle, see what they're tweeting, what kinds of stories they're retweeting, and you can get a better idea of like, you know, I think this story would be a better match for them. I think they would be interested in this. Because knowing that is gonna be really important for your pitch. All right, so you've got the reporter, now you wanna prepare your pitch. There are just a few things that I think you can just keep in mind um, to make sure the pitch is as successful as possible. Um, number one, Know the news, again, we've been talking about doing your research, you know, figuring out like that this person has been writing about these types of topics, there's an actual trend that's happening, you know, you already know this stuff. Make sure that you have that context ready um, and be able to explain to the reporter like, this is why I think you specifically should write about this because I know that you're interested in this kind of stuff. Um, same thing, you know, know your target, like what I already said why this particular story would be a fit for this particular reporter. Um, I think other than that, you know, make sure you know your messages. Think about what are the two or three main things that I want this reporter to know. You know, like, so like, for example, like for first place for you or anything like that, we want to make sure that we highlight the importance of, you know, making sure that foster kids get support when they exit the system. Like that is the main idea that we want this reporter to think um, and other than that, you know, especially if you're working on like legislation or like a more controversial topic, um, try to anticipate any difficult questions um, that you might get, um, and just you know be prepared to have those sort of ready. Like you know, these could be some myths or you know things that people like ask about that are not true. You know, have some answers ready. Uh, yeah. So again, prepare, prepare, prepare. Research, research, research. Um, and then once you're ready, uh, decide how to uh, you know, reach these reporters. We generally recommend two to four points of contact. Um, so two to four instances where you reach out to a reporter. Um, and actually, a recent report came out from Cision, which is a huge tool that people use to reach reporters, um, that 93% uh, of reporters prefer email. You know, unless you already have you know, this is a friend, a close contact of yours, you can just kind of hop on the phone, you know, hit them up on Twitter, be like, hey, I got something, that's cool, but pretty much always you want to start on email. Um, and generally, send an email, give it a couple of days, you don't hear from them, send another follow-up email, you know, if you're still not hearing from them, um, if you have their number, you can give them a call. Um, I recommend really just leaving one voicemail. <laughs> just one. Just one. <laughs> Um, don't try to hound them. Um, and uh, if you like, really, really, really think that this would be a perfect story for this particular person, um, you can also you know, find their handle and try to tweet it at them. Uh, you know, just be prepared that uh, you're going to have to try and narrow down what you want to say to 140 characters or less. <laughs> um, but I think all that said, you know, two to four times, if you're not hearing anything, move on. You know? They might just be super busy. Maybe it's not something that they can get to right now. Um, there's no need to sort of like use up all that precious time on one person, and you can move on to a next target. Um, and a side note about tweeting: um, it's great for your organization to be tagging reporters on Twitter if you're sharing articles that they wrote. But if you're pitching a reporter, it's best to do that from a person's yeah. Twitter handle. Um, it's it's strange to have a person-to-person -person interaction from an organization's property on social media. So if you have your own Twitter, or if you can get your executive director to tweet at them, that's probably gonna be more successful if you're pitching them than if you do it from your organization's Twitter account. Cool. The pitch. So, um, it's never going to be possible to say everything about your organization in a pitch. Um, side note, you knew you weren't just going to see a Giants player on a slide. We're both from Oakland, so <laughs> there's our A's representation here. Um, be brief. 
it's going to be difficult. Uh, you're going to go back and forth with multiple people in your organization who are going to want to make sure that their program gets mentioned too. But really, really, truly, the longer your email is, the less likely they are to read it. Uh, please keep your email to, to three paragraphs, maybe four paragraphs, and if you're going to call them, uh, practice with a friend. Make sure you're talk not talking for more than 20 seconds. Say the thing you're going to say, stop. Wait for them to say they're interested. Don't give them your, your three minute long elevator pitch right off the bat. Um, uh, customize. M make sure you would explain exactly how it relates to them. Personal. Make sure you have their name. Make sure you spell it correctly. Uh, <laughs> we've all had that panic moment after sending an email. Oh crap, did I put this person's name in it correctly? Don't let that happen to you. Read it. Read it again. Make sure it's their name. Make sure it relates directly to them. And make sure that the most important information is first. If you have data, make sure it says in the first paragraph, we just came out with some data. Not like, our organization is this, and we work with these people, um, and this is why it's important, um, and it relates to a national trend, and we have data. You have data. Put it in the first paragraph. Um, we have some examples here, uh, and we'll put the pitches in front of you. Um, Let's see. Mistakes to avoid. So many, many nonprofits, um, we know why. It's because of a lack of time and resources. They'll have a media list of maybe 10, maybe 20 reporters. And whenever they have news, they will BCC all of the reporters on one email. Please, please, please do not do this. Okay. Um, it will be considered spam. The reporters will put it in their junk folder. And they're going to be less likely to open an email that you send them in the future. Um, if you invest more time in fewer reporters, you're going to have a greater chance of success. Uh, people have this idea of pitching as a numbers game. Uh, well, if I send it to 100 reporters, one of them has got to write about it. No. If you send it to three and you do a really good job of customizing it to them, you're going to have a better chance of getting the coverage that you want. Please don't send a mass email to reporters. Um, also, don't send attachments in your email. Um, here's an example pitch. Uh, this is the first place for youth pitch we use for the Super Bowl. Uh, we put why this person should know about it. We mentioned some stuff he covered in the past. Um, so the Super Bowl pitch, uh, we had some NFL players. Their names are in bold. Um, there's a stat about the organization, about their results. That's also bold. It's full of quotes. Uh, I mean, links. So we link to the First Place for Youth website. We link them to if they want to see more stats. Um, instead of sending an attachment ever, if you have something you really want them to see, put a link. Um, you can also wait for them to ask you for the thing that you wanted to attach, so you can send it in the follow-up email. Like if you have an image you really want to send um, that doesn't live online, you can say, let me know. I've got an infographic. If you want to see it, let me know. I'll send it over. Um, the most important information is at the top. Uh, also important facts are bold, links, short, customized. Um, <clears throat> based on what Mercy had said about making sure you've seen their past coverage, um, subject lines are very important in emails. I'm sure a lot of you know this since you send emails on behalf of your organization. Uh, with email services nowadays, you can even test subject lines to see which ones work better uh, for your organization's emails. For these emails, you should be sending them from your own personal account again. Um, sending them on behalf of the organization itself is going to be less personal. Um, but if, you, if they wrote a story recently that you liked, put it in the subject line. Put RE headline of that story. They're definitely going to open it if it relates directly to them. Um, if as much as you can customize the subject line, you should. Customize to their beat, customize it to a, re a recent story they wrote. Um, here's another example of a pitch that we did. This, is, this one was for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. They were releasing a report. So you see that there's actually no links in this email. We were using this email to get them to say they wanted to see a pre- uh, sort of a preview copy of the report. And in order for us to actually send that to them, they had to respond and say, yes, I want to see that. Yes, I want to see that, and I agree to not publish anything about it before July 16th when it's released. 
Um, we have bolded the key stats uh, and sort of broken it up into digestible uh, bite-sized pieces of data. If you've got a report, uh, a data report that you're releasing or you're using someone else's data, um, you can't put all of the stats that you want to put in the email. You got to pick like two or maybe three. And same thing, you can't really overwhelm the, or the uh, reporter with, with context about your organization. It's really the top three things. Um, and don't stress out about not getting all of the information into this pitch. A pitch is meant to be the start of a conversation. Um, you shouldn't think of it as, okay, I've got to fit everything that I want to be in the story into the pitch. It's not like that. It's meant to start a conversation to get them to say, yeah, I want to learn more. And then you set up the interview, and then that's the time when you do that knowledge transfer of everything you want to be in the um, <clears throat> final uh, piece. Yeah. Um, just so you guys know, we, I, I think we'll work with Lisa to make sure that you have copies of this presentation, too, so you can have the sample pitch emails and all the good stuff. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I have a super cool question about this one. Um, yeah. So at the very end, you said I've also shared this with Tom Jacobs at PS. Mm -hmm. um, so you're letting him know that you also that you're also share that you're also reaching out to another specific reporter or to another person. That is a great uh, flat. So this journalist is at Pacific Standard, and I'm letting her know that I shared it with someone else who also works there. Okay. So there's nothing a journalist hates more than pitching it some, something to their editor and finding out that someone else they work with is already writing about it. They will hate you forever. <laughs> <laughs> they will not forgive you for that if they've already started working on a story and then they find out that someone else at that same newspaper is writing about it. Um, but I hadn't heard from Tom Jacobs and I didn't want to wait. Yep. So, and if he emailed me back, I would have said, hey, I also sent this to Lauren, and we're following up. Um, we've actually already scheduled an interview. Um, but if you want to, you know, she's putting it in the blog, so if you think it co could go in print. Um, the other thing, uh, Mercy mentioned follow-up emails. They do work. Most of the time when I get a, a media hit, it's from a follow-up email, not the first email I send. Um, and you can just sort of reply all to your original email so the subject slide in there like, hey, just bringing this back up to the top of your inbox. I know you're super busy right now. That will always work. They will always be super busy. Yeah. So you can always say, it's a crazy time, I know. It is always a crazy time if you're a reporter. <laughs> so that will always resonate with you. Oh, they know me. <laughs> they know my struggle. Um, so yeah, so email them again, bring it back to the top, say, hey, and if this is not a good fit for you, can you let me know who it might work for? Um, and that's good too, because maybe they're ignoring it because it's not exactly on their beat. Maybe they're ignoring it just because they're already on deadline for something else. And they might say, you know, I actually don't have time to do this, but you should email this person. Um, and we've gotten a lot of success that way too. Um, so just a couple other things to keep in mind, other tools, media tools that you can use. Um, to get the information you need to reporters. I'm sure some of you are very familiar with these tools also. Um, so press releases, um, I personally like to think of them as, you know, say uh, someone gives you the keys to the SF Chronicle um, and you can write your own story. Um, that's what I like to think of as the press release. Um, so it is a story as you would want it told. It has the information, it has quotes from people. Um, I definitely recommend not going over a page. Um, and then in addition to that, there's also media advisories. So contrary to that, a media advisor is more of a quick like who, what, when, where, why type of scenario. It's mostly used for events. Um, so it's especially helpful for TV and radio folks. Um, so you know, say you're having a rally again at the Capitol, um, you probably want to send an advisory um, you know, with your pitch to TV and radio reporters so they know, OK, I'm on the go. You know, I only have an hour to get the story. Where do I need to be? Who do I need to talk to? When is it? But that kind of stuff, you know? Um, and then visuals, I think, are also very helpful. You know, if you already have photos, um, videos, useful infographics of your organization at your disposal, um, you know, offer those to a reporter as well. You know, again, put yourself in their shoes. They have such limited time, um, you know, and if they're trying to work on a story and you already have pictures, they don't have to send a photographer out there, you know. You already have an infographic that, like, shows some really neat data in a visual way. Maybe they can add that to the blog post that they're going to write up, you know. So keep that kind of stuff in mind. I have a question. Yeah. At what point do you use press releases? Oh, you're right. <laughs> Um, 
so you remember how I said, what if someone gave you the keys to the SF Chronicle? Um, so if you look at your press release um, and say, say to yourself, would this actually be in the news? If the answer is, I don't know, or not, don't issue a press release. <laughs> um, so, you know, if it's like, oh, well, we just got a $1,000 grant, you know, probably not going to show up in the Chronicle, right? Like, eh, no need to write a press release, you know? So I would say, again, thinking back to your news hooks, like thinking back to that main question, do I actually have news? That's when you want to use a press release. Um, and, you know, I've, I've worked with some organizations that have had in their, like, communications media plans that, oh, well, we want to send a press release every month. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why? <laughs> Are you going to have news every month? So, again, it's not a numbers game. Really, only use it when you need to. Because press releases take so much time to write. Um, your board members are going to want to edit it. If your executive director is quoted in it, they're going to want to edit it. It takes a ton of time to get a, a press release over the finish line, so you only want to have one if you really, really need it. Um, and nowadays, reporters don't actually rely on them as much as they used to. Um, press releases can be good because some smaller outlets will just pick them up and run them as stories in their outlet. So we did do a press release for the um, for the report that was the second pitch email we put up there. Uh, and it, it ran in a, in a lot of sort of submission-based outlets. Uh, but for example, for that Super Bowl pitch, we didn't do a press release. Uh, this, if you spend all the time that you would otherwise spend writing a press release, doing customized pitches to journalists, it's probably going to go farther. Um, so ask yourself if you need a press release, then ask again, then ask if you really, really, really need a press release. <laughs> Yeah, and more like making a comment, I'm not sure, but more like a question in terms of press release and communication in general. I think actually we just had an example a couple of days ago on the Women's Day. We already mm -hmm. wrote a very well written press release about our new, just release some e course online. But even our executive director know that it's not many reporters will actually pick up the story because no one really cares about this course that we just translated for some women in prison. And no one will report that news, but we still wrote that press release, and on that day that we were supposed to release that, the day before we had an actual very big news for our, comp for our organization, so we already issued a press release. So on the Women's Day, that what we did is we actually sent out more like an outreach message, and we embedded the press release in the end that mm. has a link, it's not even in the email body, but <laughs> we, call it, we still call it as a press release, and it's not just sent to the media uh, group that we already pre-grouped. So I don't know if that's common or that happens <laughs> to other people. I think I got a little bit confused about in terms of the general communication strategy and when to advocate for this press release and how to fit that into the general communication. So more mm -hmm. like a question come in general. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, again, like Alyssa said, like. If, if it's not necessarily news, like all that time that you spent on the release, you could have spent on the actual email right. to the reporters. You know, I think there are times, you know, if there, you know, is like new data or something that you're releasing, and you know, you do have a press release, like people do, you know, in, you know, um, insert that in the bottom of their pitch email. Right. But again, just think, you know, given time and your goals and your resources, you know, what is more useful to use that time for? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times it will be on that pitch instead. Um, and if reporters are interested, they'll ask you for more information. You can set up an interview, you can send them more information via email. So again, I think it's more about time. And if a reporter asks you if there's a press release for something and you don't already have one, don't feel like you have to write one. Say no. Say there isn't a press release for this, but you can. I can set up interviews for you. Yeah. Um, we've had clients contact us. Someone just asked us for a press release. We need to write one. No, it's okay. They were wondering if you already had one. Yeah. You don't need to hurry up and write one um, because all the information that would be in a press release, they can gain through interviews. Yeah. Yes? When we do a special event, uh, you still just got three more pitches and you can press release about the event. Yeah, if for events, so then I would consider a, a media advisory. Because then it's, it's not as time intensive, like with the quotes and all of that for the press release, it's more of like, 
Real quick two sentence, here's what's happening, who's going to be here, what is it, why, when, like literally it can be in bullets, you know, it's something quick that uh, reporters can look to, you know. So I would, for events, I would definitely look at an advisory. Yeah. When you're sending out an advisory to, like say you're, you're building a new media list, you haven't sent out any pictures yet, you have an event coming up, mm -hmm. would you just include an advisory in, like, <coughs> Example of the pitch email you have and yeah. still make it really personal? Oh, yeah, totally. I've totally done that. So, for, um, yeah, you could definitely put it, again, like no attachments. So, you could just copy and paste it, like, you know, below your signature. And then in your email, you can say, you know, you have the customized pitch, like, why this matters to them. And you can say at the end, like, oh, if you want more information, the full advisory is below my message. You know, then they can just scroll down, take a look. So, yeah. Don't do that, you know that? Okay, so you've done an awesome customized pitch. The reporter is like, hmm, yeah, I'm interested. Can I talk to you or someone from your organization? Awesome. So now we move on to the interview. And a lot of times, you know, people get really intimidated, but honestly, just think of these three things. And really, you'll just need these three things to like make an interview the best it can be. Um, number one, you know, have your messages ready. Again, what are the two or three main ideas you want to get across? Have those ready, you know, write them down, have them in your notes, practice with a friend. And um, once you start talking to the reporter, say these messages over and over again. You know, it's okay to repeat, you know? A lot of times people remember things until they hear it seven times. <laughs> um, so have those messages, repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, number two, Definitely have some personal stories in your back pocket. You know, again, like you said, with the human interest, um, having people's personal stories really put a face to an issue. Uh, so, you know, if you're working on, you know, education and you're trying to pass, you know, this legislation, and say, you know, we work with this mother who, you know, has a son and she's really been affected by STEM, you know, being able to, like, illustrate the issue with those stories is really helpful for the reporter as well. Um, and then third, if you, have, if you happen to have any data points, um, feel free to sprinkle those in there as well. Um, it's a way that you can bring your point home, but is it like 100% necessary? Um, so don't worry if you don't necessarily have that data. And it doesn't have to be your data. Remember right. I said you can use Pew data, you can use census data, you want to sprinkle in some percentages, that's great. And it doesn't have to be something that you actually did all the work to do. Yeah. Um, and then some mistakes to avoid when you're in an interview. Honestly, I think the number one thing is just never wing it. <laughs> you know, again, prepare, 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 research, research, research. Know the reporter, know the kind of things that they like to cover. Know your messages. What are the two, what is the main point you want to get across in this interview? Um, just be ready with that. And then, you know, like even what we were saying um, earlier, you know, if there are any, um, you know, difficult questions that you anticipate, you know, write those out on a piece of paper and answer them. You know, practice with friend. Um, and, you know, along those lines, I would say, you know, a lot of times if you're talking to a reporter and you find yourself, you know, the conversation is going to a place that, you know, you're, that's not the point that you're trying to make, don't be afraid to steer the conversation. You know, if you really wanted to get this event across, but now they're talking about your executive director's dog or something that doesn't have to do with anything, you know, feel free to like steer it back, you know, say like, you know, it's a really good question, but I think what's really important to remember is blank. You know, there's little phrases like that that you can use to just bring the conversation back. And honestly, just to be safe, assume that when you're talking to a reporter, anything you say could be used in a story. So this off the record thing, no. I would say, just think of it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> if you uh, find yourself talking about something you don't want to be, in the story, don't talk about it. <laughs> um, and this is also a really big one. You know, if you, your ED, whoever the spokesperson is, find themselves, you know, the reporter asks a question they don't know the answer, um, that's okay. It's fine. Don't guess. Don't make up anything. And it's totally okay to tell the reporter, you know, that's a really great question. Um, I don't have the answer right now, but, you know, I can send you more information to follow up email. Or I can connect you with someone has that answer, you know. Actually, reporters really appreciate follow-up. Um, so if you don't have the answers right then, 
totally fine. Don't freak out. Great, Emily. Perfect segue. <laughs> the follow-up. <laughs> right, yes. So the work does not end when, when the interview is over. Um, number one on here is deadlines. Reporters are always on strict deadlines. So make sure you know what their deadline is. Ask them. Say, what's your deadline? And once they tell you what their deadline is, try to honor it. Um, deadlines are not flexible for reporters. Um, they're go to print. They are set by their editors. They don't have control over them. Um, and if you know for some reason that you know your ED is out sick that day, they won't make the interview, you're not gonna make the reporter's deadline, just let them know as early as possible, as soon as you find out. Even if there's just a chance that you might be able to miss, you may have to miss the interview, let them know the more lead time you give them, the more time they'll have to make alternate plans if they can't make that deadline. Um, offer experts. So uh, you, if, if that situation Mercy described happens in an interview where you say, actually, that's a great question. You know what? I think you should talk to our lead data researcher. Or, you know what? I think that that would be a great question for someone who's a part of our organization who is served by it to answer for you. So offer to connect them to other people. Ask them if you, know, you can help them with any stories in the future that are related to your issue, even if they're not going to be about your organization. Make sure you're a resource. Um, and say thank you. Um, <laughs> make sure that when that story comes out, you respond, you say, this is a great story, thank you so much, and put it on your social media, tag that reporter on Facebook, at mention them on Twitter when you share it, um, mention them when you send out your email. They'll know that you're mentioning them, they'll see the likes, they'll see the follows, and they'll thank you for it. Yeah, a lot of times, you know, with social media being such a huge thing right now, likes and shares are pretty much currency for reporters, you know? So if they see that, you know, this, you know, um, article about this particular issue and organization is getting a lot of hits and likes, they're like, oh wow, this is actually a really big thing. I might want to keep my eye on this, you know? Or like, this was a really, you know, this is a good idea to talk to this organization. So, yeah. Um, so I think along those lines, um, Contrary to popular belief, reporters are people, so don't be afraid to make a new friend. Um, there's lots of ways that you can interact with reporters and cultivate relationships, even if you don't have news or anything at that time. Um, you know, you've, you've already done the research, you know their beat and the kind of things that they're into. If you see an article or new data, maybe you have a partner that just came out with some new data that you think that the reporter would be interested in, shoot them a little note, just be like, hey, you know, I just saw this data come out from one of our partners, or I saw this really great story that I think you'd be interested in. Check it out, you know. Reporters really appreciate that kind of stuff. You really want to ultimately position yourself as a trusted resource for them. Um, so even if, you know, you might not be promoting your organization 100% of the time, they can still come to you for anything that's sort of related, you know. Um, and similarly, like, give them a shout out. Maybe they just wrote a really awesome story that is related to your organization or that issue area. You know, reporters get a lot of negative email, and they actually really appreciate it when people send them, you know, you know, this was a really powerful article. I'm really glad you did that. Um, you know, thank you. There's actually been a few times where, like, I haven't heard from a reporter when I've, like, pitched them, but, you know, because they've been super busy or, you know, what have you, but then they wrote a really great article, and I was like, hey, this was really awesome. Like, thank you for that. And they said, oh, I really appreciate that. Thanks. They always respond to those. Yeah, you know? 100% of the time. <laughs> Maybe like 99. <laughs> they're more like, yeah, it's just, it's a good way to just kind of like build that relationship, you know? Um, and yeah, again, you know, I think uh, it was in a similar um, CISION uh, report that recently came out, but 73% uh, of reporters actually rely on social media to build relationships. So if you're on Twitter, BD's on Twitter, you know, use it as a way to communicate with them. Yeah. Great. Media ready checklist. So this is sort of a recap of what we've gone over so far in this presentation. We've done a lot. <laughs> we've done a lot. <laughs> so we want to take a step back and sort of think about what we've covered so far. So you start out, what is my goal? Is media going to help me accomplish my goal? Maybe it's not. Decide that before moving any further. Do not pass go <laughs> before deciding that media will help you accomplish your goals. Who's my audience? Specifically, who's my audience? 
not general public, not women, not voters. Who is my audience? It's conservative policymakers in the Central Valley of California. It is women homeowners in Los Angeles. It is um, college educated people who are in the education sphere in Oakland. Something specific. So who are those people that you need to reach your goal? Then what's my news hook? Why is this important now? Why should a reporter write about it now? Why is it important? What makes this prominent? What makes this timely? Uh, where can I reach my audience? So I've decided that I need to reach those Central Valley conservative lawmakers. What news outlets do they read? What radio shows do they listen to? And then who at that radio show might be interested in covering this? Which reporter should I pitch? Who at that newspaper has written about issues related to my organization in the past? And then what are my key messages? What are those two to three things I am going to say and then say again and then say again? Um, you will be sick of it. That means that that person will probably be registering it as a thing for the very first time. So don't be afraid to repeat yourself, get those key messages, tell those personal stories, leverage that data, um, and then the follow-up. Make friends with that reporter, say thank you, put RE headline of their story in the subject line of your email to them, they will open it, they will say thank you, and you will have a friend. <laughs> so, what if in the beginning here, you say, what's my goal? Will media help me accomplish my goal? Or the questions that Mercy asked, um, do we have people who could be interviewed? Uh, do we have the person power to do all this stuff, this back and forth, this research to find reporters? What if the answer is no? That is okay. Uh, there are lots of other ways to go um, in the owned media sp space. So you'll hear communications see people talking about earned media, which is the kind where a reporter writes the story for you. Then there's owned media, where you actually write something yourself. Um, this can actually take a lot less time. Um, you know, your communications person or you can write something, slap your executive director's name on it, a board member, have them review it, and submit it to the Huffington Post. You might actually get more uh, impressions and views that way than you could in a particular media outlet. So consider your goals and really think about these things. Um, letters to the editor, op-eds, uh, the, the opinion pages in the newspaper are actually some of the most read. Um, and depending on the news cycle, what's going on, if, if an event happens in the world and you don't have time to pitch reporters, you need to respond to it immediately, an op-ed might be the better strategy to go with than media pitching. Um, so Huffington Post, Medium, um, it's sort of easier than ever these days to submit your own content uh, for spreading on social media. And blog. So um, uh, earlier you asked the question about uh, the the new course that had been translated that you weren't sure that we needed to write a press release about. Um, this is a great example of something that would be better than a press release for something like that. So if your organization has a blog, um, write a blog post about it. Put it on your blog, ask maybe one of your partners to put it on theirs, get a couple people tweeting about it, because um, stuff that might not rise to the level of San Francisco Chronicle could still be really cool for a lot of people to know about. Um, we found our clients being cross-promoted on um, things like blogs from financial advising companies that pick up something about how young people should have better financial skills. So you might find yourself being cross-promoted or, or reposted in places you don't even expect. I just find um, kind of related to that. I found that a lot of these papers are like blogs do that they zero out when they're like, we're just going to cost specific tempora. Like, here's something that we did not write, but someone else wrote, so we're going to copy paste it. Right? So I got, I don't know if you guys have had any experience with that. Yeah, absolutely. So as, as Mercy mentioned, um, sort of a product of this new environment in media is that reporters just have way less time. There are fewer of them working on the same size newspaper. Um, it's just an unfortunate trend in journalism. I, I think that we'd all love for reporters to have way more time to do lots more in-depth stories, but you know these days they really don't. So you'll see um, stuff getting cross-posted a lot more. You'll see press releases running intact in newspapers more than you would. Uh, you'll see stories from the AP running in 
probably every newspaper ever. Uh, so a great way to get instant saturation media-wise is to pitch the AP. Um, the AP has a San Francisco bureau, and they also have an East Bay bureau. Um, is that true? Maybe it's just San Francisco. But either way, they have, a, they have a staff of reporters that specifically reports on Bay Area news. So getting AP pickup is a really fast way to, to get it out there. Um, but of course, with an AP story, you're going to want to spend way, way time. more time making sure it's exactly the story you want, because it's going to show up in 100 local newspapers the next day. Yeah. And making sure that you know it's targeted to that specific reporter, too, since you know, they get thousands of submissions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just one more question. Yeah. There's a lot you talk about. You say you can just ask someone to promote it for you. Like you just say, "Hey, do you want to spread this for me?" Like, I mean, on Twitter, if you have something, is yeah. it generally okay that you just, you know, hack someone and say, "Oh, let's, you know, do spread this together"? So, is it generally okay? I'm not yeah. So, sure. for, especially for blog posts, um, nonprofit organizations have had great reciprocal relationships with cross posting each other's blogs. Um, for search engine optimization reasons, getting a link into your website really helps your performance and standing on Google. So if you say, hey, you know, link to this and we'll put a link to your organization in it or some other ways to, to set up a, a mutual relationship with someone else who runs a blog that's relevant to your organization and then you can say, well, cross post something of yours or you can actually cross post something of theirs first. They'll definitely see it and then maybe a couple weeks down the line, ask them to cross post something of yours. Um, yeah, uh, and you can ask them to do that on Twitter. You can email it to them. A lot of blogs are, are looking for content more uh, proactively than say uh, reporters would be, so it can be a little bit of a, a lower bar ask to ask for cross, cross posting of blog posts. And blog posts should be short, um, sort of, a, a an aside about blog posts, um, like a page in Microsoft Word, um, if it's way too long, uh, blog posts will not get read. I think that um, we just wanted to pause for discussion. I know we have a couple of questions uh, coming through already. Uh, we've got our emails here for you, business cards on the table, um, and yeah, we want to hear from you. Uh, what other questions do you all have? Um, are there any things that popped up while we were talking that you want to speak more about? Anything you want to go into detail about? Share a story or experience from, from your work life? Mm -hmm. I do have a uh, immediate contact me from the past. Uh, some work we done in the past caught me off guard. Uh, you know, the newsworthy issue that he was working on, he called me about some work that we had going on. Mm. Uh, you know, in the past, it's kind of off guard, so I wasn't really prepared to talk to nobody, but I gave him, you know, some of the stuff that I remember. Uh, but, you know, uh, is there a time to say, well, can, you, can I get back to you? Or, I mean, I know they're working on it now, so can you take time out and say, well, let me call you back when I get time? Or, I mean. Yeah, I think when situations like that, you know, I think first of all, just you know, thanking them that they, you know, contacted you and, you know, just really getting clear, like, you know, what's, well, what's your deadline? You know, I really want to help out. When do you need to have this information by? You know, I can go talk to some folks to help bring you more information, send you some links that could be helpful. Um, and if, you know, you're really caught off guard, I think it's totally fine to just say, like, you know, can I give you a call in 30 minutes, in an hour, you know? Like, when is this due? I want to be as helpful as I can and gather as much information or useful, you know, folks as I can. I think with stuff like that, I think it's totally okay. Yeah, you, you want to be as helpful as you can to them, but I mean, I'm sure they understand that you're not sort of poised and ready to answer any question mm -hmm. in the whole world, like on the drop of a hat. Yeah. Hopefully they will be more than an hour away from their deadline when yeah. they give you a call. So yeah. absolutely say, you know, I want to ask my executive director about that. Maybe I can actually set you a time to talk to him. Mm -hmm. Or maybe, um, you know, you can just, go around and ask a couple people. But right, ask them the questions you need to know. Like what's your angle? What's your deadline? What is the story you'd like to be able to tell so that you can come back to them with stuff that's going to be as helpful as possible? Mm -hmm. Good question. Yes? 
If, if you're a small organization and you think maybe your story isn't big enough to be of interest to, um, uh, to a reporter, is it worthwhile going and collaborating with two other organizations or other organizations who have a similar story to share and pitch that together to a newspaper? And what would be the loopholes or challenges that could come up doing that? I think you definitely can do that. I think I would go back again to just making sure like what your goals are and what your audience is, especially you know, if you're small and nonprofit, like think about well, like why do we want to get into the news? Are we trying to build awareness? Are we trying to grow donors? Like is this the right strategy? Um, but I mean in situations where like you know maybe you, you do have news, there is like some new data or anything that you're bringing up. Um, you know, there there are situations where we've had, you know, multiple nonprofits like going on something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, that would actually be one of the news hooks too. If you can establish a trend, like I said, the sort of the, the rule, uh, the general generally accepted rule is that it takes three to establish a trend. So if you're a, you're if you're an organization that's working for um, helping fourth graders learn to read and you can find two other organizations in other towns or cities that do the same thing. Um, around some particular point of urgency, then you've got a trend. Um, so teaming up with organizations is a great way to establish a trend. Um, you know, you want to be mindful of politics, too. Um, I know pitching stories with multiple organizations is tricky because um, folks will get mad if the other guy's executive director gets interviewed and not theirs. Um, but if you're going to go into a partnership, be ready to come to the table as a, as a real partner. Because if this other organization makes it into the story and yours doesn't, your issue still got good exposure. So try to keep an open mind when going into par partnerships like that, because organizations who work in the same space as you, you know, you're on the same team. You're not really competing with each other. You're competing for mind space with all the other things people could be thinking about, you know, like what are the Kardashians up to these days? They should be thinking about how kids can learn to read. You know, it's it's not that you're competing with each other; it's that you're you're competing with the, the rest of the noisy world out there. I kind of just said the same thing. That, you know, I think about that. Would you, as a small organization, I guess, kind of like get swallowed by, you know, say if you go with a larger organization, you know. Would they kind of swallow your nonprofit up? And, you know. But I guess if you're getting the same information out, I guess if we go back to what is the goal, because if you're not getting funding, then you know maybe the large organization will swallow you up. But if it's just a story, then maybe you know it might be a good idea. Larger organizations can actually be pretty charitable about media attention because they get so much of it, um, <laughs> especially foundations. Since we do so much grantee work for foundations, like a foundation will hire Fenton to do communication support for like a cohort of grantees. Um, and foundations are usually pretty charitable about wanting to make sure that the, the little organization gets the spotlight. You know, they'll want at least one mention of their organization's name, but typically, to my experience, um, they, aren't, um, they aren't too insistent on being the, the big one in the story. Um, but I think, again, you're right, kind of going back to the goals. You know, if it is funding, you know, thinking about, well, who are these particular people we're trying to target? Maybe trying to get into a new story isn't the best way to reach them. You know, maybe it's more of an email campaign, social media campaign, you know, some sort of event or anything like that. So I think always when these questions come up, always go back. What is my goal? What am I trying to do? Who am I trying to reach? The other way we've seen small organizations be successful in earning a prominent place in a news story where there's a much larger organization is being the source of the human interest story for that piece. So like an, a story about a big health issue that could be mostly about the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's work on a particular issue. The person, like the mom who gets interviewed for that story is working with Nurse Family Partnership in Connecticut. So that organization will get mentioned, and she'll actually be talking about her experience working with that small organization. So being the source of the human for the human interest part of a larger story is also a way for your organization to get 
a bigger role in a in a, in a media story that might also otherwise focus more on the, the big guy. Any other questions or like experiences people have shared or had? People share? Yeah. Um, I think for experiences, I think the part we were talking about is being nice to create the interview is really struggling because we sort of like accidentally, I, I don't really know how it happened, it's kind of like the year that was mm -hmm. And which was awesome, but they ended up coming out with kind of um, the, the, the story that aired, the TV song that aired. Ended up kind of like not defining their organization in the right terms. And a lot of inquiries from people were kind of frustrated because they had a different impression of like the services that we provide. So that was kind of like one of those. So I think the moral of the story was it should have been we need to be prepared for this instead of we should avoid doing this at all times, which is sort of the way organization is going on. So yeah, having those messages and stories ready. All right, well, I know we're at time. Um, so if there are other questions, you know, me and Alyssa will hang out here for a few other minutes. Also, you, you know, get our, um, you know, business cards, send us emails, we're here. But really, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be with us. Thank you.